It's no surprise that energy plays a crucial role in our lives. We use energy to heat our houses, fuel our cars, power our phones, and the list goes on. All of this energy comes with massive environmental downsides by the name of greenhouse gases, which fuel climate change. Not all energy sources are created equal. Combining the emissions of carbon dioxide and CO2 equivalents from each energy source is a common way to quantify those GHG impacts. This metric is calculated in units of grams of CO2 equivalents per kilowatt hour an energy source produces over its lifetime. In the electrical sector, coal and natural gas dominate the global market. These are both the most common sources of electricity and the most polluting. So, let's take a brief tour through some of the pros and cons of the most common replacements. Before we get there, a note. We shouldn't treat renewable energy as a single source solution. Our green future requires a mixture of most, if not all, of the renewable energy sources we're about to discuss, and more. Hydroelectricity is currently the most common renewable energy, but dams need rivers to power their massive turbines, so they can't be placed just anywhere. Nuclear energy, while not technically renewable, is a sufficiently abundant source of low GHG energy. Of course, nuclear power plants come with several high-profile risks, though they still have a better safety record than the history of fossil fuel power production. Wind turbines are a leading source of clean and renewable energy. Unfortunately, they have a large physical footprint and must be deployed where high winds can be expected. Biomass is certainly renewable and generally burns cleaner than fossil fuels, but that doesn't mean that they are particularly green. At Solaire, we focus on solar energy. So the rest of this video will focus on energy that we harness from that great fusion reactor above us, the sun. The current king of solar power are solar cells based on silicon. For the most part, this means mining up quartz and going through an extensive purification process. In a previous video, we go into more detail about how silicon solar cells are made. As a quick recap, silicon ore has to be smelted, isolated, purified, and crystallized, all at extremely high temperatures, for days. Then they can finally produce wafers which can absorb sunlight. These long, high temperature processes mean high energy cost and large facilities. High energy cost means increased GHG emissions to the tune of approximately 43 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour of energy produced by the solar cell. Silicon is abundant, but high purity silicon is not. To put this in perspective, it would take about 400 megatons of silicon to produce enough silicon solar panels to meet our global energy needs. As of 2015, approximately 50 megatons of silicon are produced every year. So, if a concerted effort to produce traditional solar panels hijack the entire silicon industry, it would take about eight years to mine enough silicon to make those panels. And during those eight years, you can forget about making any new computer chips. Now, let's consider perovskites, the center point of Solaire's company mission. In the same video that we explored silicon solar cell production, we also explored perovskite production. In short, perovskite solar materials are crystallized from a liquid solution on top of a glass or plastic substrate that will become the solar cell. Low temperature processes and a smaller facility footprint means fewer GHG emissions than traditional solar cells. Perovskite solar cells only emit about 11 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour of energy produced. So, let's take a look at a 100% solar future with perovskite solar cells. Thin film perovskites only need one-fifth of a megaton of its core mineral for the 100% solar future. Meanwhile, annual production is about 35 megatons per year, which can extract enough perovskite minerals to electrify the world in just a few days. In a green economy, we always have to keep in mind one question. What happens to a material when it has reached the end of its life? Solar panels are expected to have 30-year lifetimes. While some valuable metals and silicon cells can also be removed easily, recovered silicon almost always has to be repurified, which is neither cost or energy effective. In the end, recycling silicon solar panels costs $15 to $45 US per panel, and throwing them in a landfill costs less than five bucks. As a result, most silicon recycling comes from government mandates, which are few and far between. 
In contrast, there are real opportunities for perovskites to be part of a circular, green economy. At the end of a perovskite solar cell's life, the layers can be separated and reused in new solar cells. Remember, unlike crystalline silicon, perovskite layers crystallize out of solution and they can return to solution with common solvents. Dissolving each layer makes separation, isolation, and extraction of perovskite precursors easy to design in an economically viable process. The process of reusing all materials in a perovskite solar cell is still emerging. But this exciting field is generating research to streamline this process and make a fully recyclable perovskite solar cell. Our hopes at Solaire are to accelerate our green future by developing and improving our solar power options. Among green and renewable energies, silicon solar power has the worst CO2 costs. By contrast, perovskite solar power will be among the cleanest and greenest energies. Additionally, a green economy has to consider the long-term impacts of its creations. Landfills filled with solar panels built on a 30-year life cycle will waste both resources and space. So the next generation of solar cells must have recycling built into its DNA from the start. And perovskites hold that potential. If you're interested in learning more about Solaire's mission towards a green future, stay tuned for our next video.